breaks Who breaks the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing
trusted today. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. You would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. we sing for all that you've done me yes
All right. Hey, one other thing that I really like about this church is we have a lot of different people in here that have so many different unique giftings and callings and anointings, and so we like to try to give place to that. And today, we have something special. We actually have the dynamic duo. We've got Susan and Mary, and these guys are going to kind of tag team it this morning. So uh, just open up your cup and let the Lord fill it up. Hey, that rhymed. Thank you, Chris. We want to start this morning with a video that Lighthouse Christian Products produced for us. And today, guys, we have the amazing honor of having the wife of the wife and husband team that began Lighthouse Christian Products. I want you to please welcome Pat Nazinski. Pat, stand up. Yeah. They started Lighthouse Christian Products in their basement, actually on their ping pong table. <laughs> and they started finding out about the miracles that God is doing now. And they began making videos, creating videos to highlight each one because as you'll soon hear, Mary and I both got miracles, but God is creative. He didn't do it the same way with me as he did with Mary. And Pat and George Nazinski began creating these, these videos, and I want you to see mine right now. Thank you. Susan had a lot of medical problems early on. I mean, she's always kind of had medical problems, had heart issues that were all pre-symptoms of what she ultimately ended up with, which was the autonomic dysfunction. Well, I knew that she had had problems with her autonomic nervous system, which is, uh, you know, as a physician, it's a little complicated, but basically uh, it's the, the nerves that control like your temperature, your balance, your heart rate, and, and multiple other, other things. When blood is not where it's supposed to be, when blood is not circulating the way it's intended, it's really exceptionally painful. And my organs hurt, and the doctors explained to us that dysautonomia, or autonomic nervous system dysfunction, is progressive and terminal, and that there wasn't anything we could do to stop it just um, to try to keep me comfortable. We received the diagnosis that uh, Susan's symptoms were progressing and getting a momentum that was not good. I took between 45 and 60 pills a day to regulate all those different body systems and to take care of the pain. I got her, uh, her chart from uh, Greensboro and she had she had two charts full of medical records from all over the place, from uh, Greensboro, from Duke University, from Chapel Hill, from the specialist in, uh, uh, in this dysautonomia. Uh, she had two of them, they were this thick. And I went through them and documented that, you know, I, I showed that she really did have these, all these diseases. In the hospital, they wake you up for all these zillions of reasons. And I had this little um, notebook by my bed 
And when they woke me up, I would just jot things down. I'd written down Randy Clark's name five times. I didn't know who he was. So I started asking the doctors, do you know Randy Clark? And they're like, no, I don't know Randy Clark. I asked the nurses, they didn't know a Randy Clark. Susan called me one day and said, um, do you know who Randy Clark is? And I said, yeah, you should Google him because he's over a very large international healing ministry. Um, I've been to his conference. So I got home and when I looked, he was coming to a church 30 minutes from my house. We made the determination Sunday before the conference that uh, as soon as I got back from my business trip, we would probably have to get Susan involved in hospice care because it was just, it was overwhelming the family. I went to the very first day of the conference and it was all I could do to walk in and sit down. Right as she got seated, they called a break. And um, David Miller was also at the conference, a friend of both of us. And that morning I said to him, you know, Susan is not well, she needs prayer. And David said, oh yes, my wife and I have prayed for her. And I said, listen to me, David. Susan is dying. We have got to get her prayer. And he went into high action. So when he spotted Susan, he had set it up and he comes running up and he goes, Susan, Susan, he'll pray for you now. And she said, who, Randy? He said, no, Rodney. And she goes, who's Rodney? And um, Rodney Hogue was one of the speakers. Well, we were doing a healing conference in High Point. North Carolina and uh, I was doing this conference with Randy Clark Global Awakening and I just got through finishing teaching my morning session so I uh, asked Rodney I said well before we leave we got plenty of time at this point before we leave would you just take a moment and pray for Susan um, and he kind of was a little hesitant because he was kind of in a hurry and had just given one of his talks or whatever, but he said, oh, well, sure, let's, let's, let's pray. <laughs> I sat down and, and uh, she, you know, she just kind of looked at me and, and uh, I said, well, what, what can I do? And he asked me, what do you want me to do? What would you like prayer for? And I said, I want you to slap me upside the head and say, be healed in the name of Jesus, because that was gonna be quick, it was gonna get it done, and then we could all go back in. And instead, he was like, no, nah, I don't really do things that way, but um, we'll see what God has planned. She just said, I've got these few things. She mentioned a couple of things, and I, they weren't quite registering, because at this time, I'm like listening to the Holy Spirit. Like, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do this? So she, I said, okay, well, let's, let's pray. He did not um, even lay hands on me. We didn't hold hands, we just prayed. And uh, when we finished praying, I, I asked her, I said, well, how are you feeling? She goes, I, I feel good. <laughs> I said, well, great. By the time he finished, I was just so peaceful. And I opened my eyes and was like, I feel no pain. I feel no pain. And with that, I kind of just slumped in my chair. I didn't know it, but like the Holy Spirit was running all through me, healing and restoring. I knew then that I was completely healed. The beautiful thing for me is I have 30 year history with Susan at the time. I've known her, she's been sick. I had already personally prayed for her. Um, so I have the privilege of seeing the Lord absolutely radically heal somebody. This was a creative miracle that she had been for years and had these, these nerves being destroyed and all of a sudden Jesus just recreated the nerves. God touched her and it was really evident that God touched her. I did not understand that people could be completely healed in a moment. I just, I did not understand that. I, I physically absolutely knew that Susan was completely changed and was just not sick anymore. You know, it was like lunchtime and she was able to eat things that she hadn't eaten before. And it was as I was beginning to hear her story uh, throughout the day because we, we connected at lunch and we connected uh, uh, later on that day and she began to share with me a little bit more of her story, I began to really see how 
dramatic this healing really was. So I waited over a year before I went back, and my doctor, who is the world-renowned expert in dysautonomia, he gave me a clean bill of health, and he called it a spontaneous remission, which is Dr. Babel for a miracle. It was God, Amen. Amen. all God. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Guys, I was a second grade teacher before I got sick and had to stop. Now my favorite thing to do is to pray for healing because Jesus loves to heal. He does. And part of being a second grade teacher, I love fairy tales. And my favorite quote is, fairy tales are more than true not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. They can be beaten, guys. My dragon was dysautonomia. Yours may be ALS or MS. It may not even be physical. It may be alcoholism or a, a child in your family. It may be finances. Jesus wants to help us defeat whatever dragon it is that is out there because that is who Jesus is. The word that I got for today is to stand and trust. When David met Goliath, he didn't run. He didn't run to the rock and go, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? No. He stood and he trusted that the Lord would bring him through it. Now, the first time that I was in Bible study and I actually heard a word on David and Goliath, guess who my substitute teacher was? Right here, Mary Oz. We were... Um in a Bible study to get together with Beth Moore teaching videos and teachings and it was a large Bible study so Susan and I had never gotten to know each other. I knew her name and I knew she was not well. So they asked me to substitute one day and it turned out it was on the patriarchs and it fell on David and Goliath. And Holy Spirit had me step out of the page and move over to here. And as I began teaching on that David understood that he was in blood covenant with God Almighty, Holy Spirit whispered to me, she needs what you have. So I looked over to see who he was talking about, and it was Susan. Susan is the only one in the room taking notes. The rest of them are looking at their books and looking at me because I have gone off script. And, and what I want to share to you about David is David showed up. He has bread and cheese to bring to his brothers, his father sent him to go check on his brothers. So he shows up with bread and cheese, and Goliath of Gath is making this proclamation, send one man out to fight me, and if he wins, we, the Philistines, will be your servants. But if I win, all of Israel will serve us. And David says, what will this man get? And so the people around him say, oh, you get to marry the the king's daughter, and, and your father never has to pay taxes again, and, and it's looking really good. And so David, David says, well, tell the king, I'll, I'm that man. I'll go. David had spent time in worship as he kept his father's sheep. David was a worshiper, and through worship, he had entered in to a relationship where he knew he was backed by all of heaven. So the king goes, come, come, put on all my armor. So David tries to walk in that armor, and we know that it did not fit him. He could not move about in it. We need our own because we have spent time with the king of kings. And whatever he has clothed us with is what we have authority in. And David had used that sling and those stones when he had to kill a bear and he had to kill a lion. So David knew the victory of walking with the Lord. So when he sees Goliath, his words are, 
Who is that uncircumcised Philistine to think he can defy the armies of the living God? Circumcision was the natural sign of covenant. And when you are in blood covenant because you have received Jesus in and said, I surrender, I repent of all my sins, I believe you died on the cross and rose again. And I invite you in to be Lord of my life. When you have done that, you have had a circumcision of your heart. And you are now in blood covenant with God Almighty. So David steps up and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? What he was saying is, who is this giant who is not backed by heaven? I am of covenant. And I just declare that over each one of you. You are of a covenant keeping God. So whatever is touching you, whatever is affecting you, is affecting God. And if it has no right to your heavenly Father, it has no right to you. Absolutely. And worship, I, again, second grade teacher here, get used to it. <laughs> Guys, worship is the war ship that the sick ride to their healing. It is. I prayed in a church down um, in Mexico, and in Mexico, they worship full body for hours before they ask you to come up and preach. Do you know what happens as a result of that? Before I could even get the prayers out of my mouth, people were getting healed. They were getting healed before I even said amen. Because he is the healer, not me. And they had worshipped. And they were dripping in worship for the Lord. It's amazing to watch the Lord heal people. I really thought that April 29, 2010, I thought that was the end of my fairy tale. Because I got healed. But guys, since then... I've had the opportunity to travel to 11 different countries. Not to go sightseeing, but to pray for people. And I have gotten the incredible honor of watching God of the universe heal his children. And he does it in so many different ways. I was healed by going to different ministers and asking them to pray for me. Now, on the film, I know it's ridiculous that I thought that I needed someone to go, I, I <laughs> be healed in the name of Jesus. But guys, that's the only thing I knew. I was Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Methodist, you know, yada, yada. I didn't know. So I only believed what I saw on TV, which was wheelchairs come up on stage, the person gets be healed in the name of Jesus, slapped on the side of the head, and then they go down without their wheelchair. So I thought that was the way it was going to happen. Rodney prayed without even touching me. But she, it was, and what was so wonderful about that is that Jesus poured his healing power through me. Mary did not go to different ministers, and yet Jesus poured his healing power through her. How did, how did that happen? Before I share that, I just want to say that Susan went after her miracles harder than anyone I had ever met. After that Bible study, Susan began coming over, and we would meet about once a week. And, and I had an indoor swimming pool because that's where I had gotten my miracle, just a tiny little 8 by 14 pool. And Susan had a pick line in her arm that helped regulate her temperature because her body systems could not do what normal bodies just regularly do. So her organs would cook. And so she would come get in the pool and she would lower herself down in because the water could maintain her temperature. Um, yeah, she had a plastic bag over her pick line. Mm -hmm. Susan went after her, her miracle. And I would say to Susan, Susan, you have to believe that the word of God is true. You have to stand 
on the scripture. You have to read the word and find one. Let Holy Spirit highlight a scripture to you and put your name in it. You have to stand. You have to take your stand against all this that has come against you. In my life, um, I got struck with a form of muscular dystrophy, and the name of the disease was Charcomerie Tooth, and it debilitated. I lost use below my knees. I had no sense. I couldn't feel the nerves. Everything went dead. I had to go into leg orthotics, and then I lost use of my thumbs. I thought the use, I thought the loss of my legs was bad. It was nothing compared to using, losing my thumbs. Now it's almost, it's so hard to drive. You can't hardly sign your name to a check. You can't cut up vegetables to even make like a pot of soup. Two of my children are here today. Jacob, wherever he went, was absolutely amazing. He helped cook dinner night after night. And my husband took care of me and five children those years. And we just put systems into place. And, and I didn't talk about it. Now they could tell I was in pain. Um, but I didn't talk about it. A lot of times it took me sometimes 10 minutes to get into the house. There were three steps. And the pain was so great to go up one step, I just had to stand there until it subsided enough that I could take the next step. My children were very helpful. And, and we never made it about the disease. So a friend of mine said, oh, what your children learned when you were sick. I said, they didn't learn a thing. She said, oh, Mary, you are wrong. Watch this. Jacob, Jacob, come here. So he runs up. She goes, what did you learn when your mother was sick? And he went, you go to the front of the line at Carowinds when Mama has her scooter. <laughs> I encourage you to never make it about your disease. You keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the author and finisher of your faith, and you press. So Susan and I began going anywhere I thought someone would pray for her. And I have to tell you, I took her to a Morning Star conference in Fort Mill, and this is a funny story. So um, we're sitting in that whatever that street's called out there with the little shops. And a lady walks up and she goes, oh my gosh, you have the spirit of death all over you. Now we already, Susan and I know she's dying. And, um, but I'm thinking I look pretty good. <laughs> and she goes, I know what it looks like. My uncle died last week and I can see those things and it is all over you. And I'm thinking, oh my Lord. And she goes, can I pray for you? I thought, good, we're moving this in the right direction. So she prays and then we go in the meeting that night and um, she goes up for prayer, and her name tag is flipped backwards, so you can't see her name. And this lady goes, uh, have you ever heard of a town in North Carolina called Star? I'm like, what is going on? And I looked at the lady, I said, why, why are you asking her that? She goes, I, I'm standing here, and all I can hear is Star, 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 Star. And so I just reach over and flip her name tag around, Susan Star. And she went, oh, and so she prays for her. So we leave that day, and I said, Susan? You should be encouraged. God knows your name, and he knows your dime. <laughs> so we were... It was two years before I was here. Yes, two years later. So we were always flipping things. Whatever is coming at you, you need to flip it. You need to flip it to the bright side. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. You need to press. And, and See it from heaven's perspective. What mayor... What Mary did was she saw what had happened to me, and she saw it from heaven's perspective. God did know my name, and he did know that I was dying. And Mary, remember when Mary mentioned that I needed to find a scripture? Well, I did. Psalm 118, 17. When I read that, it just leapt off the page. And it says, I will not die but live and will declare what the Lord has done. Okay, and being the elementary school teacher, I took it to heart and thought, well, she's telling me I need to stand on it. So I wrote it on slips of paper, got scotch tape, taped it in all my shoes. So, so then I am literally standing on God's promises each and every day. So when she gets healed, and she goes up on stage, and Randy Clark's filming it, and we're standing there, and, and she said, I stood on the promises, and she pulls her shoe out. I thought I was going to fall over. I'm like, oh my gosh. So Susan stood. So whatever it is, it could be depression. 
And you could have 20 to 30 years of whatever it is you are facing, but I'm telling you, today is a new day. And take up the weapons of your warfare. And it is the name of Jesus. It is the word of God. It is Holy Spirit. And it is the blood. Those are your four keys to overcoming whatever it is that has come against you. My journey was different. My, um, my heart got wounded. And, I, and, and six months after my heart got wounded, um, this disease, in one step, we're out on a walk, and I went to take a step, and both legs froze. And Rich and the children have gone ahead, and I begin calling his name, Rich, Rich. And he's like, come on. I'm standing in the middle of the road, which wasn't a great place to get frozen. And he's like, come on. And, and, and I'm just looking at him. He comes back. He goes, what are you doing? And I said, I cannot walk. He goes, what do you mean you cannot walk? I said, I, I couldn't even wiggle my toes, like nothing. I could not move. It was like I got frozen in place. So he, he put the children around me, because here I am in the middle of the road. And he, he went, ran home two blocks, got our van, put me in, all the children got in, took me home. So now I'm in the house and I'm trying to figure out how to go backwards. You know, I mean, nothing, there was nothing in me. If you cannot raise your foot up, you can't go forwards. You have to be able to lift your foot to take a step. And so I end up in Chapel Hill and they make leg orthotics that fit my legs and, and, um, and we get a scooter donated and we install it in the vehicle with a button so it can, you know, lift in and out. And um, so a lot, a lot of life just kind of shrank down. And so um, that was in 1998, August of 1998. And my body begins atrophying because if you're not walking, your bones can't hold their density. So I used to be taller. Thank you, Jesus. I'm still not no, too short. <laughs> I lost an inch and a half while I sat. And um, um, Rich said, Mary, the few muscles you have left, we have to do something be because everything was shriveling in my body. And so he started an addition on the home that took three years, and the children are very good at laying brick and block, and they all learned construction in those three years. And so he put this addition on. So in... Um, the spring of um, 2004, Rich said, tomorrow the temperature will be up. You can get in the pool for the first time. So this is from 98 to 2004. And so I take my Bible out there because I thought I'll have some time with the Lord before I get in this pool. So I've opened the cover. There's that beautiful water. And I let it fall open. I apologize for all of you who just don't like that. But... Um, she does the school thing, and I do like the three-year-old thing. I am as childlike before the Lord as I can possibly be. So I let it fall open. It falls to John 5, and I read about the man at the pool of Bethesda. So when I finish those couple verses, Holy Spirit says, and I, I have talked with Holy Spirit since I was seven years old. He has been my life. I have dialogued with him, and he wants to dialogue with you. But you have to dial down all that other stuff in your life. A lot of times Holy Spirit doesn't even let me have the radio on in my car. He is so jealous for me and communicating with me. So I just speak that to some of you who have background noise going all the time. Now, I love worship music, but you have to dial things down to begin hearing clearly. So Holy Spirit says to me, what do you think of that story? I said, what's well, a nice story? He goes, you don't believe it. And I said, well, I've never heard anyone preach on this story. I've never heard anyone talk about healing angels. I mean, I was, I'm just honest with Holy Spirit. I'm real honest. My friends can't believe how I talk to Holy Spirit sometimes. They're always like, I cannot believe you said that to him. But Holy Spirit knows my heart. So, so he, Holy Spirit says to me, if that man was not seeing miracles, he would have gone somewhere else. And in that moment, a seed of faith came into my heart. And I looked over at that pool and I went, I have water. I, I, I want John 5 angels to come do that stirring thing in this water. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're going after a miracle. You need to be reading this out loud to yourself. 
You need the Word of God coming out of your mouth and into your ears or however you're going to do it so it is literally going in. So I went on a two-year journey almost every day in that pool, and I took grape juice out there and crackers. I took communion because Holy Spirit said, you need to come in to covenant with God. You need to come in in communion, come into oneness with God Almighty. And so one day, so I'd walk in the pool because I couldn't swim. They said, your bones have to have impact. So it wasn't like I was swimming, but walking, I wasn't afraid of falling in my pool, and the water helped hold me up. And so I didn't have to worry about tripping and, you know, like I did on land. So I said to the Lord, why is this happening to me? And he said, why do you think this is me? Because, see, we think that God has done everything, like that all this is God's will, whatever happens to us. And he said, why do you think this is me? And I said, what are you talking about? He said... <clears throat> look around heaven. I have no storehouses of sickness to give anyone. Well, that'll change your paradigm. That'll make you go, whew. And I said, well, okay then. What is this? And he said, John 10.10. 10. And this became a dividing line that from that day on, I would divide my life by John 10.10. 10. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. He said, you must now line up your entire life by this scripture. And if it is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, you stop making an agreement with it. If it is bringing life, agree with it. And I said, and he said, and stop saying you have charcomery tooth. Now I'm out on a scooter. People go, what's wrong with you? And I said, now, Lord, you know, I don't want to be fruity. So uh, I just don't quite know how to go about this and not look like, I can go, I'm fine. He said, this is your answer. You say, I'm fighting Charcomery Tooth. Those are key words that you need to know. You are fighting whatever it is you're fighting. And he said, in the garden, I said, let there be. And everything came to pass. He said, you are created in my image. And whatever you are speaking is going in your ears. Every cell is listening. And your cells will begin listening that you are fighting, and you will watch things change. So I went on a two-year journey walking around that pool, and the Lord said to me, I want you to get Morning Star music. And I said, why? I, 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 wasn't, I had read the final quest, but I had not been to any Morning Star or anything. And he said, they are, they are on the prophetic cutting edge. Well, at this point, I'm not even sure what the prophetic cutting edge even means, but I get a Don Potter, Susie, and Leonard CD, and Holy Spirit comes. We need anointed worship. I bless what goes on and, and, and comes out of this place because they spend time with the Lord because what you do at home is what is released in public. So I begin listening and worshiping and singing in my prayer language along with those songs. And guys, she did it every day, the same songs. <laughs> every day. She brought me over every day, the same songs. They resonate through my body every day, the same songs. My husband was really tired of the CD. <laughs> Your kids, <laughs> but Jesus wasn't. So, Holy Spirit said to me, I said, Holy Spirit, well then how did this happen? He said, your heart got injured, and you did not run into me for healing, you just shut down. I quit talking, y'all. I mean, Holy I Spirit. I cannot imagine that. <laughs> Holy Spirit was hitting it on. He said, when you did not run into me for healing, because you were so wounded. And it's natural to just back up and just want to stay away from people because things are hurting. And, and, you know, you can't believe what's happened to you. And you can't believe that kindness doesn't flow sometimes from the body of Christ. You just can't believe how you've been run over. And so I just backed up and shut down. And we were in a new church. And they would say, go, go greet people. I'd stare at the ground. If shoes showed up, I'd look up and I'd go, hello. And they'd smile at me, and I'd look back down. I, I couldn't do the interaction thing. I couldn't even walk around. I, I shut down. And Holy Spirit said to me, you shut down. 
And by not running into me, that wound created a landing strip and the enemy came and landed disease. He said, you need to invite me into every room of your heart. And I said, Holy Spirit, that sounds really good, but I don't even know what every room of my heart is. And he said, it is every day you have been alive. I want to sprinkle healing till there is not one trauma left. There is a journey of the heart that we get our wounds healed, that we forgive everyone we need to forgive on a level we didn't even know was possible. And when you have tried to forgive and you keep feeling you keep feeling it, I asked the Lord recently, how do we go after this when there's still a prick to the heart? He said, ask for the spirit of forgiveness to come upon you. And all of a sudden, those thoughts can come and, huh, it just doesn't matter. There's no more pricks. Holy Spirit wants to heal every part of you. So, so in the, the Lord in those two years took me on a journey and he showed me that from birth, from the moment you are conceived, the enemy has assignments against you. And they are like arrows. So during this time, the Lord began breaking arrows off, arrows of rejection, things. Because you wonder why you keep going around that same mountain. She's like, oh my gosh, this is mountain again. Here's this mountain again. Holy Spirit cares too much about you to leave you the way you are. So you come around that mountain again, you go, here we are, Holy Spirit. You are trying to get me to let you have that a part of me because here we are again. And so when you go, have at me, have at me, you might want to add, be gentle. He had at me and I flew off a horse and got a concussion. But as, as I came out of it, I kept seeing in the spirit realm arrows breaking, arrows breaking, arrows breaking. And coming off that horse, because he asked me to pray for somebody while I was on that horse, I prayed in my prayer language. I got so drunk in the spirit on a horse, but it was a Holy Ghost setup. Because that day was my birthday. And my daddy calls on my birthday. And days later when my memory started coming back, I'm like, I think my daddy called me. So I called him, did you call me on my birthday? And he said, I did. And I said, did I invite you to my house for Thanksgiving? He said, you did, and I'm coming. Now, my family all lives in Charlotte, and there's four siblings, and they do everything down there. And if I want to see them, I kind of had to go to them. And so I would invite them to things, and it was real hard to get them to drive because it was so convenient because they're all living there. And so I always felt like I was on the outside looking in. I always felt like I was the least of the five. And so when he said, I'm coming, I said, are my siblings coming? He said, I don't know. You'll have to ask them. I felt chosen. God wants you to know how chosen you are by Jesus. You are so chosen by him. You are not on the outside looking in except the enemy has told you a lie and you stepped over here and agreed with it and said, yep. It, this healing thing seems to work for everybody else. These miracles is for everybody else. But that day I went, I'm chosen. And it, it will change something in you to be chosen by God himself. You were crucified with Christ. You were on the cross with him. You were a part of him that day. And you died with him and you rose with him and you are seated with him. And I just want to share that there is the more. And, and a couple of weeks ago, the Lord gave me something new. And, and this church is pressing for it. So I'm going to just go for it. <laughs> Can y'all put up that picture? So the Lord said to me, I want you to begin praying for the seven spirits of God to come upon you. And I didn't know, I do a lot of prophetic art, and I was in a conference, and the Lord said to me tonight, paint the seven spirits of God. And I, I said to my friend, it sounds scriptural, seven spirits of God. She goes, oh yeah, it's in the Bible, because I'm thinking, you know, we got the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What's this seven spirits of God thing? You need to search the scriptures for the seven spirits of God. The spirit of Yahweh. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of the knowledge, of the f and the spirit of the fear of God. 
And I began crying out for the seven spirits of God. And he said, now hone in on the, the spirit of the fear of God. Father, I want the spirit of the fear of God on my life. The fear of God on my life. When you step into the spirit of the fear of God, the scripture says it's the beginning of wisdom. That's where you start. So I've stepped into it, and I'm starting to step toward the spirit of wisdom. So I'm new on this journey into these seven spirits of God. But I'm in Texas, and I'm at a friend's home, and I'm getting dressed. So I'm sitting on a chair, and I'm putting on my socks, and I look up. Can, can, can y'all turn off the lights for a minute so y'all can see this? Can y'all see it? Glory. All right, never mind. A glory realm breaks in. And it's thousands of dancing colors. And I'm, I'm looking at it. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you that you would press in to the more. When God made Adam, he made him and he crowned him with glory. You are meant to live from a place of glory. And we know that, that when Adam sinned and he went, uh-oh. That glory, that crown of glory was lifted off of him because he had separated himself from that glory realm and he turned the glory and the dominion over to the enemy. But Jesus, the second Adam, came back to restore us to God by his blood and to the glory. And that is why scripture says you are being changed from glory to glory to glory. And so... I'm looking at this realm, and Holy Spirit says, go get your friend Kim. And I went, okay, it probably won't be here when I get back. I'm real honest with Holy Spirit, but I'll go get her. And she's drying her hair, so I'm knocking, thinking, come on, before the glory realm leaves, come on. So she, come, she opens her door, and I said, can you, can you come to my room? And she goes, yes. So we go in there, and now there's two realms of it, two streams of it. And they're dancing streams. And she just looks at me, because she can't see them. So I have a quiet dialogue with Holy Spirit, and I say, what do you she say? She could not see them. I said, what do you say, Holy Spirit? That's a key question for your life. What do you say, Holy Spirit? And he said, have her go sit in the chair. So I said, well, would you sit in the chair? So she sits down, and one side of the room realm opens up, and she went, <gasps> and she jumps up, and she's like, oh, my gosh, look at this. And I said, well, there's actually two of them. So she moves over to where I am. And now the other realm opens up. God is breaking on the scene all over the earth. You can turn the lights back on. All over the earth that his name would be known. It is going to be through signs and wonders that we will not just be another religion that has our book. But we will be the people of God who carry his light, who walk in his miraculous power. And I want to take it another step. Come up here just a second. Jacob, pause. Bless his heart. So I came back from Texas, and the Lord said, I need you to go meet some new people in South Carolina. And I said, I just came home from Texas. He said, I need you to go meet this couple in South Carolina. And I said, I leave for Chicago Thursday. He said, I need you to go meet some people. I went, okay. So I called my friend who had told me about these people. I said, we need to go on Tuesday and Wednesday. We need to go meet these people. She said, well, I'd love to, but I have to call them and see if they're home. Ah, oh, That never crossed my mind. I said, yes, yeah, a good point. So they were home. And, and I traveled down there with a friend and the angelic realm shows up for 24 hours off the charts. So they invite me to come to something else. So I invited some friends to go with me, including my son. And um, it's so off the charts what God did. And, and just to give you one little bitty taste to make you so hungry to walk in this glory realm that the things of earth just fall away and the troubles of your life get so under your feet in Jesus' name that you are the head and not the tail and you are above and not beneath and no weapon formed against you can prosper that Jesus is your king, he is your Lord, he is your healer and this is black and white. 
and what he says he means. This is not like some stories from way back when that just happened in the days of Acts for the apostles. We are the last chapter in the book of Acts. We are living the last chapter of this. I love Holy Spirit. So, so I get a couple of my kids to go with me because I'm telling them glory stories. And my children have watched my life. And they just, and I'm looking at them like, and, and my daughter Elizabeth sitting there, she goes, Mom, we know it's true. We know your life. Because I'm looking at them like, are you believing any of the stuff I'm telling you? Because it was just so far out there. We're sitting there and I'm going to tell you all this one because it's going to mess with you. But his presence he who overcomes shall eat of the hidden manna, Revelation says. And we've been in a time of worship. And all of a sudden, we can all smell bread. I'm like, that's kind of weird. Nobody's been in the kitchen for hours. And they go, we got to go find it. We walk around. And on the bookcase is a whole loaf of bread. And she says, touch it, Mary. I reach my hand out. It's hot. I want you to get in the book of Revelation and I want you to read what says will come to those who overcome and I want you to know it's happening on this side. It is happening on this side. So I take them to this conference and two more loaves have come to this house since I had been there and they froze them so they could bring them into the conference. And I'm, y'all, I'm being brave but I am so after him, and I so want all of us to walk in the glory. I want us to press into everything he has. And it is not about the manifestations, but it is about the world knowing his goodness. It is about the world knowing how real he is. So before they open the one loaf, the man says, God has shown me that there's gold in this loaf of bread. Gold. And so in front of everybody, we all gather around, they split it open, and there's gold filament all through it. And you can eat the gold heaven. You can just eat it. It's just baked on in. And then the next day, he says, before we open this loaf, I want you to know there are gemstones from heaven in this loaf. And um, there's quite a few people in this room who were handed one. <laughs> and so he said, there's six. There's six gemstones. And so they open the loaf and four, because you, unless you pulverize that loaf of bread, you can't tell where the stones are. So they worked hard to find the four. So um, there's a whole row of people right there who have those out of that loaf of bread back there. And, um, and so um, four come. And then that night, he, he has shown that my friend Patty right there is supposed to have a gemstone. So he goes, we're going to take forks and we're going to go through, because now they've torn it into bite-sized pieces because we're going to have communion the next day. And they take forks and they go through this loaf and they find Patty's stone. So in the morning they gave her hers. And then they come up to Jacob, and I'm going to let you tell this part. All right. Um, during worship, I'm in the back corner, which, I mean, I tend to hang out in the back just because I do. Um, but um, he comes up and he informs me, you, you remember me saying that there were six stones in that loaf of bread. Um, the sixth one hasn't manifested yet, but if somebody else gets it, just wait and see what God does. Um, because he informed me that he was told that it was for me, and therefore I was going to get it. Um, and <clears throat> another point, as well as loaves of bread from heaven, um, the wine that we were drinking um, was initially water as well. So it is, it is for today the things of the Bible. It is not of the past. It is for the day. Um, so he informs me that. I go, I received that. And uh, continue on worshiping. And then we get time that we're getting ready for communion. And I have this thought, and I go, if it's not in the bread, it'll be in the wine. Okay, I'm good with that. Um, and communion wine cups get passed out and bread little pieces get passed out and uh, we're getting ready and communion like he's about to start doing um, the passage for communion and he goes 
today it's in the wine. Like I feel like it, it's it's in the wine. This, that, and the other. And uh, I was like, I I accept that too. Um, <clears throat> and he goes, I know that it's in my wine glass. And he walks back towards me and he goes, Would you like to trade with me? He goes, I would if I were you. I went, I I'll take that. So we switch glasses and uh, I I mean as stated, I've heard plenty of stories, so I know it's all legit. Um, and to not psych myself out, as we switch glasses, I glance at it. You can see through the glasses. I glance at it, but then I, I, I and I, I did not look thoroughly, but I refused to like psych myself out that there's nothing in the glass. So I, I kept from looking at it, and the passage for communion is given, and uh, take and eat, and I take and eat, and there was nothing in the bread, which I was okay with because I, I was still confident that it was in the wine, and take and drink, and as I take it and I lift it, as I take that first little bit of a sip, I hear clink as it lands in, into my glass, and uh, lo and behold, I get that little stone right there, and uh, that was in the bottom of my glass, so yeah, it is, it is for today, it is not of the past. And it's good stuff. And so they looked at the stone and they said, this stone carries all these colors of the seven spirits of God. So Susan and I have pressed heaven that every one of the body would come into the fullness of God. And, and we're going to be here in, in my team back there. I'd love for y'all to pray with us too. That, that those of you who just want an agreement for whatever it is, whatever arrow that has been sent at you needs to be broken, whatever giant in your life needs to be annihilated, we want to have that point of agreement with you that this is your day. And I just want to sing a, oh, um, you know, we live in Moravian Falls now, and I, Holy Spirit has shook me for years in private. I never knew that that would ever come publicly. And a lot of times when I do prophetic paint, I just shake. And sometimes I shut my eyes and people are like, that messes with us. And I said, I can't see the canvas anyway. I just invite the angels to come paint it. Because if my head's shaking and you can't see forward, just let the angels do what they're going to do. But I want to sing because I've been sitting out in the woods with the Lord and, and a song, a prayer language song that carries a frequency and a sound of heaven. And it is causing things to break off people. And I'll give you this testimony. I went into a shop and before I left, I said to the young man, I said, take out your phone and I must sing over you and you need it recorded. And that's pretty brave. And so uh, he, I, I saw him recently and he said, Mary, no one else came in the shop for two hours. I was stuck on my couch right by the door. He said, I couldn't move. And he said, I want you to know that because it was recorded, every time the stuff that has come against me has come, I have hit play. I've gone off all my medicines. I encourage you to stir up the gifts that are within you. I encourage you to stir up because the prayer language, and if you don't have your prayer language, it is time. It is time because the enemy is locked out when you hold it on the bashinda bakande, and that's why he's fought so hard against it. That's why he's told you you're making it up. That's why he's told you those lies because the enemy is locked out when Holy Spirit becomes your prayer partner, and it is an uninterrupted prayer to heaven. When you go with Holy Ghost in your prayer languages. And before I do that, I want to pray the prayer that I pray over my family every day. Father, I lift up Rich, myself, Faith, Marie, Angela, Jacob, Elizabeth, Tim, and Matthew, and who my children will marry, and my grandchildren to a thousand generations. And I apply the blood of Jesus upon us within us, around us, between us and all evil and the author of evil in Jesus' name. It is because of the shed blood that we have access to everything in this word. Jesus is the word. We have access into him. So I want you to close your eyes. Holy Spirit, we invite you in right now because you know every need that is here and every need online. All over the world, you know every need. 
So we invite you in, Holy Spirit. We invite the angelic realm in who minister. (laughs) And so, Papa, in the name of Jesus, I slice through every arrow that's come against your people. Every assignment, Papa, that they can stop going around these mountains, that you do the healing of the heart, that you go into every room of their heart and sprinkle healing now. Now, in Jesus' name. Yo, hey. He is your healer, he is your healer. Salvation is of the blood. He is your healer. He is your lover. He loves you with an everlasting love. And there is nothing that you can do to make him love you more. And there is nothing that you can do to make him love you less. He loves you because he loves you because that is who he is. So you must journey into your heart. Make peace with what you have done. Make peace with what was done to you. Make peace with what you didn't do. Make peace with what wasn't done for you. As you make peace and you be a peacemaker, you are a son of God. Yeah, In the name of Yeshua, in the name of Yeshua, we loose miracles, healings, breakthroughs. We loose the more of heaven. We loose the supernatural realm to break in our everyday lives just because you love us. We thank you that your word is yes and amen. We thank you that by one drop of the blood, the enemy was defeated, and we choose to partner with John 10.10 on the side of life and life more abundant. Papa, we bless all those listening, and we say that what he has done for Susan and I, he will do for you. He is no respecter of persons. He is a good, good God. In Jesus' name, amen.